engaging today's K through 12 students. Next on Economic Outlook. A portion of Economic Outlook is underwritten by Northern Indiana Workforce Board and Partners for Workforce Solutions and by the Progress Club offering women of all ages an opportunity to develop lifelong friendships, challenge the mind, and work for the welfare of children and families. Hello, I'm Phil D'Amico, Director of Business Growth for the Chamber of Commerce of St. Joseph County and your host for Economic Outlook. President Obama has asked Congress to overhaul No Child Left Behind to address some school systems that are failing our children. Today we'll look at different strategies local schools are using to re-engage students and prepare them for life after school. We'll find out what creative means are working and the successes behind of it. Joining me in the studio are Rob Staley, from The Crossing, an accredited private school for at-risk students. Yolanda Turner-Smith from the South Bend Career Academy, focused on middle and high school students. And John Kennedy from the newly created New Tech High School, which will be part of the South Bend Community School System. Welcome to all of you. It's great to have all of you here. I don't know if you've noticed, but education seems to be getting a lot of discussion these days. Just, just a thought in a lot of the states and, and legislatures around our country. But Rob, maybe I want to throw some stats out at you and have you comment on this. Indiana's 35th in adult population with associate's degree, 47th in adult population with a bachelor's degree, 20,000 high school dropouts every year in the state of Indiana, and only two out of every 10 students who enter college finish. And they estimate that nearly one million Hoosiers are undereducated, underemployed. What, what do those stats say to you? Well, as a former high school principal for 20 years, it was uh, pretty obvious that uh, we're missing a large group of kids. And um, I, I think that it's uh, probably not even rational thinking to expect our public schools to be able to service all these kids today in a traditional school setting. And that's what's exciting about school reform to me is that uh, we are now providing some options for kids to go to other educational avenues. And we have got to do something because we are leaving way too many kids behind. And this is going to be a tragic situation if it isn't already so uh, for the future of our economics. Yeah, Yolanda, one of the things that we, we've seen, it was interesting, I saw a, a top United States educator make this quote, but said, if Rip Van Winkle were to have fallen asleep 100 years ago and woken up today, the only thing that would be the same would be how we educate our kids. So to Rob's point, we, I mean, we need more options for a lot of these kids so that 20,000 is just deplorable and we can't have that, certainly. And that's where charter schools come into play. Mm -hmm. um, South Bend Career Academy is geared towards those students who are not necessarily your traditional student. Um, those students who college may not be in their vision, mm -hmm. but uh, a vocation is. Um, we believe all roads lead to success, not just college. Sure. Um, students can choose paths from welding to the health professional field to even electrician, those traditional um, service fields, and they can still be successful, productive citizens. We also believe that if we educate kids to be lifelong learners, you know, if college determine, becomes in their future, then mm -hmm. they can choose that path later sure. on. Yeah, and, and John, New Tech High School actually addresses some of those individuals that are disconnected from traditional school. Um, give us kind of an overview of how, is, how does New Tech fit into this whole model? Right, and uh, within South Bend Schools, we have in, in recent years um, initiated many schools of choice in, in our high schools. Each high school has a magnet program, we have an early college program, and our newest opening will be South Bend New Tech High School mm -hmm. in August, uh, in this coming August. And w w how New Tech High School fits in is it really changes the instructional model. So what has stayed the same in high schools for those many years is that teacher-student interaction. It's typically the teacher being the, the dispenser of the knowledge right. and the students sitting more passively and absorbing the knowledge. Well, we want to turn that around and the students become the center, they become the explorers they they become the, the 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 discoverers they ask the questions as well as answer sure. the questions they work in teams so new tech high school fits into that um, by starting with a project-based learning approach yeah and, and, and rob really to, to john's point um there's a disconnect that some kids have with traditional school and 
I don't know whether it's seventh grade, eighth grade, that they start to feel that, but certainly by high school, um, you, you know, kids need to feel engaged in the process. And, and maybe New Tech does that, or, or maybe it's the Career Academy, but we're really missing the boat on a lot of those kids. Well, there isn't any doubt about that. And uh, we, we are finding, as we continue to approach learning in different ways and assess our kids' abilities, that the number one problem we're having is reading. Right. And if reading is a gateway to learning, and we have a significant number of our kids that are reading below elementary level, uh, how are we expecting our kids to excel in a traditional environment when they are reading at the elementary level? Besides that, uh, we have all kinds of issues with where are our parents today, um, our kids are running around on the street unsupervised way too much, and um, their identity, their dad that they're trying to look for, they find on the street. And those are the people that raise them and establish their norms and they are running around without a moral compass. Well, and that's a whole other show in, in, in itself, but comment a little bit. How do we, and we hear parental engagement is critical and it's huge. How do we do that? Where do we start? How does that happen? Part of it is providing programs that parents can get engaged, having an open school where parents can feel free to volunteer, but then you also have to help those parents who cannot help their students, sure. providing them with the basics and how to be a parent, or even with the skills to help their children with the homework. A lot of parents aren't engaged because they are ashamed that they can't help with the math, with mm -hmm. the reading, with the foreign language. Um, providing them a, a a place where they can come and be able to learn how to help their student. That is one way to get in, getting parents engaged in the process. Yeah, and what have you found, John, in engaging parents into, you know, the, the newer type of learning, the new tech high school, the project-based, the hands-on approach? What, what feedback have you gotten? I, do, I just think it has a lot to do with culture and approach, and it doesn't just start with the interaction with parents and teaching the parents. And I mean, that, that's part of it, and we, we do want to find ways to involve the parents, but it starts right with your staff. If you, if you set the tone, you have an open culture, you have a collaborative culture where, where you're invested and you're accountable and, and you're going to be good listeners, you can also involve students in that. Give students a voice. Right. Um, and, and I'm sure there are other programs that that's that's part of what we want to do empower them that's right make them feel feel a, a sense of ownership and a connection to the school and uh, and parent involvement can sometimes follow from that I mean if the student comes home speaking speaking positive about their experience in school and then when the parent does have the first few interactions and we welcome them in and give them opportunities it, it can sort of spiral from there mm -hmm. yeah and uh, go ahead yeah it's absolutely. not just limited to parent involvement there's an old adage that says it takes a village to raise as a child. Sure. That is really true. In our community, we really need to get other volunteers engaged, other businesses engaged, and that will start to draw more parents and other folks in to help with the education of our children. Sure. And, and Rob, I want to throw a couple of stats out here on dropouts. Lost lifetime earnings from 2008 high school dropouts in the state of Indiana, almost $6 billion. Mm -hmm. Public health care costs from each class of those dropouts, $283 million. It's a critical issue. You know, it, this really, you could just have the big discussion about economics. I mean, sure. we could stop right here and stop talking about education and just talk about economics. I mean, you could talk about how these kids are, are you know, they're consuming all of our resources through social services. Um, uh, there's all kinds of ways. It costs $40,000 to incarcerate a kid a year. Um, you know, one of the little taglines that we have in our organization is that, uh, $6,000 to educate or $40,000 to incarcerate, which would you choose? Because right. you will do one or the other. Uh, we do pay for these kids. And uh, in South Bend and also in Elkhart County, they are telling me that 75% uh, of our budget is to manage crime. And that, there's something wrong with that. That picture is wrong. Right. So, so we have to dig in really deep to see what we can do, whether it be charter schools or new tech or whatever it is, we have to recreate the model mm -hmm. because we have to go fishing uh, in a deep way to figure out what it is that we have to do to connect with these kids uh, to get them to learn. And as a, in, a, in a traditional way, our educational system has functioned so long that I'm the consumer of knowledge and I'm the stage on the stage and I'm going to stand and deliver and it's your problem if you don't learn. Right. Today we have to reevaluate that and say, I will do everything I can in any way I can to reach some kind of a, reading, a learning style where I'm touching you and the string is, is um, uh, we're, we're making an impact on your life. And, and uh, then we also have to say, and it is my responsibility to make sure you learn. 
That's not your problem, it's now my problem, and I must own that. And that's a paradigm shift in education. No question. And John, one of the interesting things, um, a documentary out, Waiting for Superman, talking mm -hmm. about the state of education. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've heard of it, uh, probably mm -hmm. being in education. Perhaps. What's interesting there is there's so many kids that want to get a great education that are waiting for a lottery ball to come up with their number on it. And that's really tough to watch uh, through our education system. How do we change that? How do we make it not about a lottery system and give every kid an opportunity? Well, we, we just have to start thinking about it, it's, not, it's not that the kid shows up and we already have a set plan. We really have to be willing to hear and think about what the students need sure. to know, what's going to interest the students. I mean, for one, the use of technology. Mm -hmm. It's one of the ways we're, we're far behind in our traditional classrooms. I, I mean, kids come in there and they're users of technology. They're sure. digital natives. They, and, and, and we haven't completely embraced that. We're embracing it in pockets here and there and we're doing what we can, um, but that's, that's one way we can certainly embrace the kids. And I just wanted to comment um, um, also on that economic development piece. Um, the dropouts and, and things are costing all kinds of money, but we also need to think about, are we, even the graduates, are they really prepared for, the econ for today's economy, for the information age economy? Employers are looking for, for um, people that can work on a team, that can be innovators, that have good critical thinking and communication sure. skills. So those are some of the things that I think some of the newer programs, um, New Tech and Career Academy, right. are, are thinking about in terms of really preparing the kids to be successful um, when they get out of high school. We hear some scary stats. When you look at, and there was a movie called Two Million Minutes, uh, depicting the life of a, a salutatorian valedictorian here in the United States, up against um, a mediocre student from China and India. Our students are behind the curve as it relates to those individuals. Um, we are now 20th in the world in educational outcomes. These, again, are some scary thoughts. If John is talking about preparing our next workforce to really be that educated workforce, we've got to start somewhere. Is, is charter schools an answer? I think charter schools are one of the answers. Mm -hmm. I don't think any school or in particular is a panacea for all the ills. Sure. But I think we need to recognize that children learn differently. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to have environments that are different for the, that will fit those children. Also, when we talk about educating children now, we need to go beyond just the technology, beyond mm -hmm. just the, the writing and the arithmetic. We also have to talk about responsibility, what it means to have integrity. When you talk to employers now, you know, they're not only looking for someone right. who can turn a wrench or mm -hmm. who can do the math calculation, they're looking for someone with integrity, yeah. someone with a good worth ethic. And those are the things we have to start building within our children as well. And, and that point's made in Tony Wagner's book, The Global Achievement Cap. He says even our best schools are graduating kids, maybe with, with content knowledge, you right. know, the, the, the three R's, are, they're pretty yeah. solid in, but they're not graduating with those, those kind of skills, the critical thinking skills, knowing how to work together, um, responsibility and citizenship. And we need our graduates to, to come out with a feeling of, I can contribute positively, you know, to society. Yeah, and what's interesting, Rob, we hear this all the time, certain kids are product of a good zip code you know, that they're in a good school system, that it's impossible to educate maybe urban city kids or kids that come from a, a distressed uh, family. You, you're in this every day. You see this all the time. You're educating those kids. What is the difference? Well, you know, I, I really believe that all schools um, have effective education. Um, they just are limited as to who they can, they can reach. And, you know, um, we have to be careful of this big bashing of public school system because I graduated from public school and you did and probably yep. around the table yeah. and half the people yeah. in this room, my kids did. Uh, they went to college, they have good jobs. It's not like this is a disaster. And I know that the, uh, the movie portrayed, you know, let's go to LA and let's go to the Bronx, okay? <laughs> let's go to the extremes. But I, I think that the point that we need to focus on is that and, um, Tony Bennett takes a lot of criticism and the guy is, uh, he's a maverick. And he is out to um, do everything he can to do something very serious about changing the system. We have got to get off of this competitive thing about I don't like charters and I don't like tech or whatever. We have to have synergy within private schools, mm -hmm. charter schools, public schools, and we have to look at this situation and say, where is the best placement for this kid? Mm -hmm. This whole thing about you're going to ruin my school if I'm a public school person. Right. If you bring a charter in town, I don't, I don't understand that. I didn't get it as a high school principal. I never stood in front of my staff and said, 
we're really, you know, we're really nervous because there's a charter going in down the road. We would say, there's a charter coming down the road. We're going to step up our game. Right. I'm, not, I'm not scared of a charter. We are now going to be, become a better school, and I think charters are going to make all of us better. And um, this whole thing about if it's not in our containment, we just do our own little thing, and mm -hmm. if it's not within our little casing, then it surely can't be very good. It's old school thinking. It's going to kill education if we're not careful. I want to switch gears real quick and talk a little bit about the teacher. Um, and, and talk a little bit about one of the things we've seen, there's a number of things, Dr. Bennett being one of them, should we compensate teachers differently? Should they be compensated by the measurable outcomes that they are, are working with? Your thoughts on that? I'll put you on the spot first. <laughs> I'm a great proponent of um, compensating, giving teachers bonus sure. for their performance, how t kids measure within their class the growth that they show. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that goes a long way, um, but that does not mean you start teachers low or teachers are right. low paid. Sometimes people assume when you talk about merit pay and bonus pay right. that you neglect the other. I think there's a, there's a mixture and it needs to go hand in hand. Your thoughts, Mr. Kennedy? Uh, I, I think there could be a role for that, um, but I, again, I don't think that's absolutely the answer. And it's not. Uh, it, it's that's easier right. said than done, especially at the high school level. Just the just the tactics of it when you have kids moving from one teacher to another mm -hmm. teacher to another teacher. I mean, how do you actually attribute growth during a school year to a particular teacher? It's 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 a difficult task. But I think we as a school corporation um, you know, need to take responsibility to grow our teachers' talent, to provide experiences and professional development, to keep growing, and then to attract good talent to the profession, because it is the most important profession out there. You were a principal. Your thoughts on what you would have if a teacher were maybe compensated more on measurable outcomes? Well, the key is, um, I, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement on whether sh people should be compensated. I think the key is the criteria for compensation. And I, you, know, you just made the comment about how do you do that at the high school level. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the tricky part. Now, I'm in a, in a private school setting, and I compensate our people when they do well. Uh, they're rewarded, whether it be a $500 bonus card or whatever it may be. We're gonna, we're, and we don't have that system where people are running around going, how did he get that when I didn't? We just take care of our people who are doing a great job, and they stay around, and they're right. sold into the system. I mean, that's a simple answer sure. for us. But we do complicate things. But I do understand uh, the whole equity thing and what kind of a criteria we're going to use if we're going to, if we're going to give people bonuses. Yeah, and I, I want to throw out some, some numbers here. Um, high school dropouts, on average, last year, 16500 annual income. High school graduates, 23400 Associate's degrees, 30200 mm -hmm. Four-year bachelor's college diploma, 52,200. Mm -hmm. Huge difference. But if you're trying to communicate this to a kid in ninth, 10th, 11th, are they even listening to this? Does this even matter? I think they do listen, but unfortunately that statistic doesn't talk about what does a licensed electrician make? Right. What does a master plumber make? Those are some valid fields sure. and they make no question. very good money. And we don't present that as an option to our children. I think children need to see what the broad spectrum is. I can be this and still be successful. I can be a beautician and yet own a, and own a shop and still be successful. Absolutely. And you, you have, obviously, this is a big part of the students that you're serving. Do they look at stats like this? Do they look at numbers? You know, just thinking, as you were saying, I, I'm just dealing with a kid this week that's going through this. and. You know, um, Ruby Payne does a lot of training on poverty, and poverty thinking is survival, mm -hmm. okay? So when I'm sitting here surviving day to day, and you tell me those statistics, I'm going, yeah, that's great, but you know what? Today. Right. And they don't really get that, and you can, uh, our middle class thinking would say, don't you get this, kid? Don't you want to make this much more money? And they go, look, uh, you know, I'm probably going to go to jail. Um, I'm going to work at McDonald's like everybody else I know. And to get them into that kind of a thinking is going to take um, some serious connection right. and serious relationship building to get them there. And that is a very difficult thing. No question. Yeah, one, one of the things that at, at South Bend New Tech or new, in the New Tech High model mm -hmm. is when you do the project-based learning, you make it very relevant and you teach in context. And, that, and that's one of the things that, that's different about it. Uh, teachers will introduce, introduce a project. They'll ask the students, what do you need to know about this? Right. And they'll 
develop their instruction based on those need to knows and kids see a reason um, to learn something kids see a reason to go to school they make a connection because they're working with teammates and classmates they make a connection with a teacher in a different way because the teacher is more of a coach mm -hmm. and a facilitator and and those are the kind of things we need to be thinking about is engaging students and finding ways to motivate students um, you know kind of thinking on their level about that yeah and I go back to <coughs> when I had a chance to tour new tech in Sacramento one of the <coughs> one of the kids there, um, Lat Latino Hispanic uh, young boy, his parents drove him 52 miles one way so that he'd have a shot at education. So that, you know, he had five friends. Four of them were dead because of, of gang violence. He was the only one left, and you know, and he planned on going to college. I, uh, kids are thirsty for education yeah, in, a, in a lot of ways. We really need to educate them to all of these options out here, whether it's the Career Academy or the Crossing or New Tech. Are, are kids listening to those options? Are they aware of what's out there? I think Mr. Kennedy hit on a real key, the relationship building. Mm -hmm. They will hear. They will listen. They may not seem that they're listening, but once you develop those relationships as teachers, as volunteers, as a community, as a staff and an administration, you are getting through. And, and let's be frank, some of the kids in high school aren't going to admit that they're right. listening to you. But when they start making those decisions on their own, you can see by the decision they make that they're listening. I've, I've, I've talked to students in, in, in a student recruitment campaign that I've been doing uh, with kids uh, to try, trying to sure. have them apply to New Tech. And it was very interesting. When I've gone, I've tried to have a few minutes on the side with some of the kids. And I would ask them, so, you know, what's important to you in terms of your high school choice? And I thought they were going to say something about the basketball team or about whether it has uni school uniforms. You would be so surprised at the astuteness of the answers. And they're thinking, well, I like this field or I, I see myself going to college in this way. I'm really interested in this. Um, I, I want to learn uh, about certain subjects. I mean, it was incredible. They really are thinking about their future, and they really are, I think, listening. And it's, it's a great time to be a student because of the choice that we're providing. Sure. It's also more difficult. You really have to start, start thinking about it early. It, it, Rob, I, was, I had a chance to tour a school in uh, inner city Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, graduation rate five to seven years ago, 13%, mm -hmm. uh, predominantly African-American, Latino, Hispanic population. Today it's 94%. Mm. They changed how they educated the kid, one, but two, they went to an all year round mm -hmm. formula. Is there data, is there support thing, information out there that tells us all year round school works? Well, we have a year round school. We run a year round mm -hmm. calendar and we, uh, we run three week breaks four times mm -hmm. a year. Our students actually have five weeks off in the summer. Uh, we went to a year round calendar uh, for other reasons. Um, one of the things we haven't discussed is we talked about schools and getting jobs. What about just staying alive? Right. I mean, I watch the TV and read the paper every week in this city and in Elkhart County alone, and there's somebody shooting somebody and somebody's dying. So let's ratchet it down to say, what can we do to keep kids alive? But uh, there, there isn't any doubt that what we did is we went to year-round calendar because that summertime, our kids have way too much free time. And free time is the devil's playground when you have too many weekends <laughs> right. off. And so what happened was they're out bored and they're going, okay, let's go do this and let's go do that. And then all at once they're running in gangs and running in, in groups. And they're, they're just bored. They need to get back into school. It was, um, it was an interesting thought that people said, you'll never be able to start school in the middle of July. And I said, why not? And they said, oh, those kids won't be ready to come back. That was never an issue with us. Our kids were back in our school ready to go because they know they're bored and they just need they want some social interaction, some relationships. Well, it was part of a family. They're part of a family as well. Absolutely. And that gets into how do we form maybe smaller groups so that kids do feel a part. I think that's a big, a big part. When you're going from eighth to ninth grade, all of a sudden you're a freshman in a large school. Man, I'm out there on an island. So smaller groups, is that an answer? Smaller groups is one way, but then it still goes down, boils down to relationships. What would what we're doing at Career Academy, we're taking in 100 kids in each class. Mm -hmm. um, and those kids will follow each other as they go through. So they'll start building those bonds among each other starting from sure. seventh grade up to 12th. And what you want to create is that culture where that positive peer pressure goes on, where they said, hey, Johnny, hadn't seen you in school in a while. What's really going on? You know, let's get down to this homework. And once you start building that culture, you'll find the kids will start encouraging each sure. other. Uh, we've got two minutes left. I want to get to something really quick. Are we going to see more options uh, coming up? I know New Tech is one, Career Academy, we've got the crossings. I mean, 
is that the answer? Do we need more different options for kids? Well, well, I don't know. I don't know that there are any more options at the high school level right now on the table um, within South Bend schools. But what there is, there's a drive to learn from the options that we have now and what's working, and especially some of the innovative ideas and transformational ideas in teaching and learning, and let those spread to the rest of South Bend schools and other schools in the region, and and learn from that, so that we're not just limiting those options to the smaller groups, right. but we are bringing them to the larger groups at the high school level. Rob, what, what, what's on the horizon? What do you think is going to happen here? Oh, where do you want me to start? <laughs> <laughs> we only got a minute and a half oh, left. Okay. Know, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's a low for you. Know, here, so. uh, maybe it's just our, um, you know, I'm a high school administrator and um, I hang around some of the most amazing guys that are uh, very successful business guys and I think it's a different way of thinking. Every day we wake up and sit up on the edge of the bed. We say, we think we're good today. How can we become great tomorrow? And what does it look like to recreate something that works? In the big bureaucracy, uh, you know, John doesn't jump up and say, hey, I'm doing new tech. Go call the superintendent. We can wake, wake up and do that. We can decide we're going to do something tomorrow right. and do whatever we have to do to meet the needs of our kids. And um, that's necessary because of the at-risk population we Where have. does career in tech ed in the five seconds we have left, where does it fit? I think it provides the flexibility. Being a charter, we can respond quickly to the needs, like you said. We understand that there are our consumers. They're also our product. Mm -hmm. And so we can respond and be flexible to their needs. Great. Guys, great discussion. We could probably carry this out for another four hours, but it's great having you guys here and great work in education. And we'll look forward to the things that you're doing down the road. So thank you for being here today. We appreciate it. Thank you. That's it for this edition of Economic Outlook, the show that puts focus on key business, education, and community elements that drive our regional economy. I'm Phil D'Amico. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time on Economic Outlook. A portion of Economic Outlook is underwritten by Northern Indiana Workforce Board and Partners for Workforce Solutions and by the Progress Club offering women of all ages an opportunity to develop lifelong friendships, challenge the mind, and work for the welfare of children and families. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.